we begin, let's, let's, uh, let's pray together. Great Father in heaven, we are just amazed and fascinated by the plan you put in place so long ago, by the sacrifice you were willing to make on our behalf, by the suffering that we know your son went through for us so that we might have hope, so that we might have forgiveness, so that we might be your children. Uh, Lord, without, without your plan, without your son, uh, we'd have nothing. And we are uh, especially thankful this morning of what a great thing you've done for us and how you have provided for us and taken care of us. And God, we have studied and read through history on how your people have failed you. And Lord, we have even in our own lives been part of that failure. We've, we've sinned, we've chosen our own way instead of chosen your way. And Lord, we, we ask for your help. We ask for your forgiveness. And Lord, uh, most of all, we, uh, we ask for your, um, your ability to take care of us and uh, to help us to uh, do better as we move forward, as we mature. Lord, we want to serve you and help us to truly grasp that every day as we wake up and to go to bed every night uh, knowing that you love us and uh, be able to rest peacefully in your care. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, we are in the book of Isaiah. We're going to uh, continue on with our study, part two. Uh, basically, we're going to take the second half of this outline. We talked about chapters 1 through 39 on Wednesday night, talked about the judgment and hope for Jerusalem that was out there, and Isaiah spent a lot of time talking about the two sides of the coin. Uh, almost everything in Isaiah has this parallel, has this contrast with some other things. So you've got judgment versus hope for Jerusalem. You have judgment versus hope for the nation. Uh, both of them were being judged for similar issues, sin, idolatry, and we're going to deal with some more of that today. Uh, they also had a similar hope. Okay, the, In chapters 1 through 39, the hope is what? Can anybody remember? Start to round chapter 7. Gives him a name. No, that, that's the people. We are, he does talk about that. We'll come back to that. But the prophecy was Emmanuel, that there was this Emmanuel, this, this child that would be born, that would be a savior, he would be a king, he would sit on the throne, he would be the one that would fix everything. He would be the one that would rule over the new Jerusalem. He, you know, he was going to be uh, the great king to come. And so he is the hope. But he is the hope not just for Israel or for Jerusalem, but he's also the hope for the nations. And so there's a lot of emphasis on Emmanuel being that great uh, person of salvation. And so we talk some about the rise and fall of Jerusalem there at the end of that section. What we're going to talk about today uh, is more of this contrast, but he kind of moves and changes perspective. We talked about that some on Wednesday night. That chapters 1 through 39 talk about uh, what is coming, the, the danger that's coming, the judgment that's coming. When you get to chapter 40, a lot of the language switches to what has taken place. But interestingly, it's what has taken place after the exile. And so you kind of have that uh, kind of dividing line there between chapters 39 and 40 where the exile to come, the exile to come, the exile to come to here's how God's restoring things. And so we're, we're going to have more of a hopeful look uh, in today's lesson. So we're going to divide it up into three sections, the announcement of hope and comfort for Israel, uh, the servant who does God's will, and the servants who inherit God's kingdom. So we'll, we'll talk about those three sections today. <clears throat> Any questions on 1 through 39 before we move forward? Or additions, things I didn't bring up Wednesday that you think are important? Because there are plenty of things I didn't bring up on Wednesday that are important. No, okay. Well, then we will we will just 
uh, move on for oh look at there we i should have not have got ahead of myself not only did you have judgment versus hope uh, i didn't bring this up but you've got the old city versus the new city uh, there's a lot of talk about that the lofty city the arrogant city versus the new jerusalem so there's that contrast that is drawn in this first section you also have the complete destruction versus the remnant the complete destruction one of the images is the chopped down tree that he was going to chop this tree down and burn the stump. Well, if you chop a tree down and you burn the stump, you don't expect anything to grow again. But he called, He says there will be something that grows out of their, that stump. There will be, it's called the seed, and that seed was going to be, as Randy brought up, the remnant. Okay, There was going to be a, a small uh Growth that was going to grow and, and be a, a mighty tree again. Uh, it ends with the people going into exile after the foolishness of Hezekiah. So that's where we ended Wednesday night. Uh, it almost quotes verbatim out of Second Kings, the story of Hezekiah, what Hezekiah did and trusting in God for deliverance from the Assyrian. That was good. We look at that part of the story and we go, yay, Hezekiah, he did good. And then you have him showing all the treasury to the Babylonians and Isaiah coming in and rebuking him for doing that because he basically says, those are the people who are going to betray you down the road. And about a hundred years later, that's exactly what happened. Babylonia comes in, they ransack Jerusalem, take all the treasures and take the people and essentially destroy what's left over. So that, that's kind of where we end and the first half or the first section of Isaiah. But it's interesting, the very next words, you know, you've got this here, uh, the, starting in verse 5 of chapter 39, the Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the words of the Lord of armies. Look, the days are coming when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until today will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your descendants who come from you, whom you, uh, whom you father, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, for he thought there will be peace and security during my lifetime. And that's a little selfish. But, yeah, you know, that, that's uh, Hezekiah's, well, at least it's not going to happen to me. You know, it'll happen to you know, one of those next people. It's interesting, the next chapter starts with like this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over, her iniquity has been pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so we begin this second section of the book with comfort. That, that's the focus. That's where we're going in this book. Uh, there's going to be some talk about sin. There's going to be talk about their failures. There's going to be talk about uh, the bad things that have happened. But moving forward, if you put yourself into the uh, historical perspective of the story, okay, we, we studied all the way up to the exile. Okay, everything leading up to the exile was, was positive or negative? Pretty negative, right? Like, this is going to get really, really bad. But if you're looking at it from after the exile, you know, kind of move yourself forward through history, uh, uh, those 70 years of exile and the restoration to come, what bad things happen now? I mean, there are bad things that happen don't, from a historical perspective. There's a lot of, but from a biblical perspective, at that point, it's all looking toward the coming covenant, the coming kingdom, right? So from that point forward, most of what we have is it's comfort, it's peace, it's the good things to come, it's the deliverer, it's the Messiah. There becomes a great and overwhelming emphasis on deliverance, rescue, salvation. And so that's why you, I think you see that being the very beginning of this second portion of Isaiah. It begins with comfort, peace, good things to come. And so people have come home. That, that's a good thing. Uh, for they, they were in exile. We know they were in exile for decades. 
But when they came home, God was able to use that to bring about his kingdom. And so all of that is good. Those are good things to come. Those are things to look forward to. Then again, if you're the reader of Isaiah, and you're living pre-exile before all of that happens, this is good news. (laughs) Because all you've got to look forward to is bad stuff is coming. But no, down the road, good stuff is coming. God is going to do something grand. Uh, What you have in here, there's a kind of an accusation against God. Look in chapter 40, verse 27. Chapter 40, verse 27. And again, we have to skip over large portions here. I apologize. Uh, Chapter, you know, Jacob, why do you say in Israel, why do you assert? What are they saying? What are they saying? You can read it. I don't mind. Yeah, God's not being fair. God's ignoring us. God isn't listening to our prayers or our cries. God isn't giving us answers for our accusations, our claims. God is, is ignoring us. Uh, God is not doing what we think God should be doing. Therefore, we will blame God. Okay? There's a lot of times when that's our human nature talking. Have you ever been in those shoes where things aren't the way you think they should be? So it's easy to look at God and shake your fist and say, why, what in the world are you doing? Where are you at? Why are you missing? Why aren't you answering? Right? We, we get into those frustrating moments, and the people are doing the same thing. Now, what's interesting is for us, we look at that and go, well, how unfair of them to make such accusation against God when it's their problems, it's their sin, it's their iniquity, it's their transgressions, right? Like we look at it from the outside and go, wow, what an arrogant people. Do we look at ourselves the same way? When we make similar accusations, when we're in the middle of difficulty and we're wanting to shake our fist at God, just like they're doing, and you know, we don't. We, we don't see ourselves with such objectivity the way we do these people because we're able to see the whole story with these people. We're in the middle of, the, of our own story, and that, that's just something to be conscious of. If there's one thing I have seen be a constant, repeated idea through the prophets, it's this. Hush. Okay, so I'm going to add, you know, we sing the song Trust and Obey, and I love that song. I'm going to add a word to it. Hush, trust, and obey. Right? That, that's really where the, where the prophets are. You know, we, we, we like to yell and scream and pitch a fit and kick the floor and pound the, pound the floor with our fist like a child throwing a fit. But okay, fine, I'll trust and obey. You know, that, that, what, how, how many times have we heard God at this point say, be silent? Be silent, hush, realize I'm at work, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You don't see it, you don't know, but I'm telling you, everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen. And, uh, and, and it's a great lesson for me personally, I don't know about you, but to learn, there, are, uh, there is never a time when I have answers God doesn't. Never. And there is never a time when I deserve to speak and God sh- has to listen. Now, God graciously listens, but I don't deserve that. Right? And, and that that's... Don't nod at me and tell me I don't get to listen. No, no, I mean, I yeah, I mean that, that's kind of where we're, we're, I think, a good lesson for us. Um, and you see that here even in Isaiah. What God does, though, in this book, and it's kind of an interesting imagery, is he sets up a trial. And you see this kind of language, if you'll, you'll look over chapter 41, verse 21, submit your case says the Lord. Present your argument, says Jacob's king. Let them come and tell us what will happen. Tell us the past events so that we may reflect on them. He calls them witnesses during this section. There is a very vivid imagery here 
of a trial scene or a court scene where God is more or less put to the test. We always think of heavenly court scenes as God behind the, uh, the judge's bench with the gavel in his hand. That's not the image given here. The image given here is that God is in the defendant's chair and that the people are making accusation. They're, they're in the prosecutor's chair and that there is a judgment going on as to whether God has truly done the job God was supposed to do or not. Is God worthy to be God? That's the emphasis here. Okay, Keith? Yeah. Yeah, hold on to that idea because we're going to come right back to that idea in the next slide because it's a really important issue in this trial scene, okay? Um, God essentially lets himself be accused and then he defends himself before the people. And he brings them, like, like Keith just said, he brings up the history as proof. He brings up his power over the nations as proof. He brings up his ability to provide as proof. He brings up the deficiency of idols as proof. I mean, he brings up proof after proof after proof as to why he deserves to be God and they deserve to shut it. Okay, I wouldn't say that with little kids in here. But, you know, that, that's, that's essentially the idea here. Of he takes away every accusation they have, every question they could have regarding his character, his power, his, uh, his, their experience with him, how effective he has been as a God. He, he basically lays it all out there from chapters 41 through 47 and takes away any reason they have to doubt he is God, he is listening. He is actively doing what should be done. And, and it is, you know, we always talk about the end of the book of Job, right, where you've got Job making a lot of those, you know, not accusing God, but questioning God through the book of Job. He doesn't sin, but he does question. He doesn't understand what's happening. His experience does not match his theology, and therefore he has a lot of question. And God basically teaches him the same lesson that we're taught in the book of Isaiah, which is, hush. Like, you know, who are you to question me? Were you there when I did this? Were you there when this was created? Were you there when I set this boundary? Were you, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? That end section of the book of Job. And God basically to Job proves himself through creation, through uh, what Job can observe and see. That's what he does here but he does it through their experience and through their history and through their, uh, you know, the, the things they have gone through as a people. And so he is, he is defending himself, not because he needs to, but because it benefits the Israelites to hear he is God, there is no other. That is an important lesson. Because until you realize he is God, there is no other. And I don't think there is no other is necessarily combating the idea of statues and idols. I think it's combating arrogance. He is God. We are not. That's the lesson here. Okay, And, and it is 
powerfully laid out. I love the book of Isaiah for this section and what, what God does in displaying that. So, you know, he, he talked about how he is powerful, he is the only God, he is worth serving as God, as, as people. He calls his people to become his servants in chapter 42, but it is they who have failed. They are the ones who have stepped away from God. They are the ones who have not met the standard that God put out there. They are the ones who are not obeying and trusting and doing the things that they're supposed to do. So when they want to sit there and say, our God is not real, or our God is absent, or our God is incapable because he has let us go into exile, what God is doing is saying, no, no, no. You're going to exile because that was what I wanted to happen. Not because I was unable to stop it from happening, which is essentially what they were saying. Okay, he is, he is basically revealing this is happening not because of me and my deficiency, but because of you and your deficiency. God says, I have no deficiency. Okay, not in a bragging way, but in a revealing way. The exile was not God's failure, it was God's response. And that needed to be understood. That needed to be told to this people. And so God proves his power by defeating the Babylonians. You know, he, he causes Babylonia to be taken captive. Look over in chapter 43, chapter 43, starting in verse 14. Somebody read 14 down through 17 so I can let my mouth wet back up. So, Okay, excellent. Now, somebody turn over to chapter 44 and read verse 28 and then read verse or chapter first couple of verses of chapter 45. Forty four. You're reading forty three. One more chapter. <laughs> Also read 3 and 4. Okay. I find it interesting that God even says, you know what? I'm going to even call your deliverer by name before he is even king of a country so that you can know I really am in control of all of this. Isn't that amazing? That God can be so specific and so willing to prove himself to an obstinate, stubborn, rebellious people so that they can know without any doubt this God is the God of the past, the present, and the future. Isn't that what you learn here? I mean, here's Isaiah prophesying before they are ever even taken into captivity during the time of, of uh, back in 
Hezekiah's time, you know, a little, little bit after that. He is prophesying by name the man who will be in control, not during the time of Babylon, but the man who will be in control in the future during the time of the Medes and Persian, the man who is going to send them home as a remnant. And God says, you know what? He's my servant doing what I want to accomplish, and I'll even give you his name. Can you imagine those who were familiar with the book of Isaiah when they heard Cyrus is on the throne? <gasps> I know that name, right? I mean, that, that would have been incredible to, to you know, I, how do you not have confidence in God when you see events unfolding exactly how God said they would unfold, even naming the people involved? And that's what God's doing here. Now, I don't know that that would have convinced Isaiah's reader. Do you think it convinced people a few generations later? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, he is, in this, setting up a reason for the remnant to truly believe and turn to him and to truly belong to him, hopefully in a way they've not belonged to him in a long, long time. In chapter 44, you have him mocking the idol worshiper and the idol maker. It is one of the most hilarious ironic portions of all of scripture where he talked about this guy who goes and chops down a log and chops it in half and uses half of it in a fire to warm himself so that he can use the other half to carve out this idol that he can bow down and worship to and that's normal like that that makes sense we do the same thing before we point fingers wag those fingers at other people we worship the money we make right? I mean, we make the money, and then we do everything we can to take care of that money and even build our whole lives around having a little bit more of that money and worship having that money so that we can make more of it so that, I mean, it, it's essentially the same thing, is it not? But we do that. I, I just, I'm, we're really good at, at snubbing our nose up at these Israelites and the sins that they did because their sins seem to be so obvious. But the truth is, if we're, if we're willing to look in the mirror a little bit, I, I find myself guilty of that. And so that's something to be, to be aware of. The people still won't hear God. They still won't do the things God says, even in this section. So God says he's going to do a new thing. Okay, chapter 43, verse 18, he alludes to it. Do not remember past events. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's not what I'm looking for. 43. Do what? 19 might be. Yep, there it is. Look, I'm about to do something new. There's something new coming down the road. Chapter 48 deals with that concept again. Uh, the idea of Israel leaving Babylon so that God can do his new thing, so that God can, can prove himself in a new way. Now, here, here, going back to Keith's comment earlier, I should have just jumped to it because it was such a good comment and he worded it so well. This is a listing in this section of the times that God says, there is no God like me or I am the Lord, the only Lord. I am the God, the only God. You think, that's the point here when he says it this man and that's just what i got through a quick reading that i did i might have missed some of them <laughs> but there's at least this many where he says i am the lord your god the only god or there is none other like me he makes some sort of proclamation about the singleness of his nature not meaning monotheistic versus polytheistic but the 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 authority, the power, the respect, the way that we should view him, there is none that compares with him. He makes that point over and over and over again. My favorite is over in chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. Uh, remember what happened long ago, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and from long ago, what is not yet done, saying, 
My plan will take place, and I will do all my will. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if, if there's ever an idea or a concept that we should be willing to think about our God, it's that. There's nothing that happens outside his will. Uh, I'm not saying we don't sin. It's not his will for us to sin. But there is nothing, no plan of his that can be thwarted. There is nothing that surprises him. He knows it's going to happen before it happens. He knows the end from the beginning. Uh, he is God. He has the power, the knowledge, the ability. He is God. There is none other like him. And I, I just, I love that that is that, that, that's what we're left with. And that's what these people were left with. Now, that didn't necessarily make that big of a difference to this people. I think it made a tremendous difference to the people, to the, to the little sprout, to the seed that came out of the stump. And what, what is the remarkable difference between the pre-exilic Israelites and the post-exilic Israelites? What's the major difference? Yeah, before the exile, they worshipped idols constantly, consistently. It was always a thorn in their side. After the exile, there's not a single reference to them worshipping idols that I'm aware of. It made a huge difference. And that, I think, is something for us to be aware of and to think about. This dialogue, this narrative here, this story that we're given about God's trial that he has with Israel. And he puts information in this trial, in the evidence of this trial, that was undeniably proof that he is God and he has knowledge of the end from the beginning. When you see that kind of power, that kind of knowledge, that kind of control over the events of mankind, and not just individuals, and not just a chosen people, but all nations. Because doesn't he prove that here? That he is crafting the behavior and the actions and the, the, the chain of events for all the nations. When you see that kind of power and control, why would you worship anything else? And I think it had that effect on the Israelites. Now, that mean, doesn't mean they didn't fall into sin, they didn't get sidetracked, they didn't do things they shouldn't do. They did. Uh, we see that very obviously when you get to the time of Jesus. But it made a dramatic difference. And that, I think, is the point of what Isaiah is doing here. Keith? Yeah, well, at this point, physical Israel did still matter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so chapters, we'll move on to the next section. Chapter 49 through 55, you've got this long section about the, the servant. Okay, we're going to talk about the servants in a minute. Okay, when we get to the last section. But in this section, you have this focus on, from chapters 49 uh, to 55, on the servant. The servant is called Israel. Okay, he is given the name Israel. Uh, he is going to restore Israel. He is going to open the door to the nations. He is powered by God's Spirit. He will proclaim what's called good news. Isn't that interesting? Uh, he will announce God's kingdom. Okay, we look at this whole section, and we have no problem seeing Jesus. Okay, uh, For these people, this does not sound messianic. The Messiah is a king, not a servant. Okay, So there's a, there's a, a gap here. For the original audience, uh, based on their presuppositions, their preconceived ideas on what the Messiah was supposed to be, 
the idea of a servant, not an exalted one, is a little bit hard to, to swallow. Okay, so understand that. It is interesting, though, how many of the images and description of the servant match the description of Emmanuel back from the beginning of the book. So we've talked about Emmanuel, this child, this king that was going to come up and you know, grow up and, and, and solve the problems. He was going to rescue. He was going to be the one that sat on the throne. He was, he was the, the one they were looking for. They had no problem identifying Emmanuel as king. But the servant, even though there's all these parallels, not the same thing. Okay? What's amazing about God's plan is we know, after the fact, these are the same thing. They, they are the same person. And what you have kind of here in the book of Isaiah is this kind of bookended idea of God's deliverer as king in, in a country that was heading toward demolition and they needed to be rescued and saved. And then God's chosen one as the servant who would solve their problems through sacrifice and through persecution and through difficulties they're the same person. And we, we have no problem seeing that. And so uh, God's new servant was going to be rejected. He was going to be killed, according to this section. Uh, we, we read of him dying on behalf of the sins of the people. Uh, it was going to be a servant's death, and it was the servant's death was going to be a sacrifice of atonement. Okay? Now, again, for all of us, we, we don't even bat an eye at that, and I think we should. We need to realize just how incredible these promises are. We're so used to them that I think sometimes they lose their effect. This is not what the Messiah was supposed to be to people, but it is what the Messiah is. And this is exactly what God intended. Uh, the servant, oddly, when you get to the end of chapter 53, is alive again, even though he's died. Okay. Again, we don't bat an eye at that. But if you're not, you know, you're on the other side of the cross, when you're not really knowing what to expect, when you're, uh, when you're very kind of um, narrowly focused on what your Messiah is supposed to be and what he is supposed to do, the idea of dying and coming alive again is not a common idea. It is not something that they it would have been a, they would have just, okay, well, this is just stuff out of order and no big deal. But you, if you read it in order, it very much proclaims the resurrection. It proclaims the idea of one who would die for the sins of people, but then he would live again and have more to do. Uh, and, and so that matches, again, our concept of Jesus and what we know he did. In the second life, this this. Yeah, it doesn't call it resurrection in Isaiah, so I'm trying to be careful about using our modern terms or our, our new covenant terms for something they would have understood under the old covenant. But in the second life, in this second activity that he's doing after his death, he announces that people are right with God again. Chapters 45 and 55 are dealing with this future glory for Israel where things are set right. Things are good again. Things are, are what they should be. Uh, they, they are back to what God intended for them to be. And so some respond to that with humility and they repent of their sins and they, they appreciate what, what the servant has done. They are called servants and they are called the seed. That goes back to remnant concept. But this is a remnant of the remnant. Okay, this is an even further remnant. This is those who have chosen to follow God. Others respond with, with obstinance and rejection. They reject the servant. They don't particularly like the servant. And they are called the wicked. And so again, in, in true Isaiah format, you've got opposite sides. You've got a, a contrast again. You've got the the remnant versus, or the servants versus the wicked. And the wicked are doing bad. They're rejecting the servant. The, the servants are those who would follow after the one servant. Does that make sense? Everybody with me on all this? All right. 
trying to make sure I watch the clock here. So the last section of the second section of the book of Isaiah is a, kind of a, a chiastic formula here. Uh, you've got uh, my phone's going crazy. Uh, you've got this uh, idea here of nations, or, or the the central idea is servants announce God's kingdom. Uh, the servant announces God's kingdom. Verses sixty or chapter sixty through sixty two. On each side of that, you've got a focus on the need for repentance and a prayer of repentance. On each side of that, you've got contrast between wicked and servants, because Isaiah loves contrast. And then before that, you've got all nations invited to join God's covenant family. Okay? The reason this matters is, and we, we don't spend a lot of time talking about uh, Hebrew literary structures and things like that, a chiasm uh, is designed to emphasize, is designed to make one point the central point. And the central point of this last section is God's kingdom. That this servant was going to bring about a kingdom that belonged to God and God only. And so that became a really important uh, part of this structure of what, what happened. So uh, you've got the, uh, the, the, uh, the, that focus there. It's a lot of poetry. The whole book of Isaiah is a lot of poetry, but this last section particularly is a lot of poetry. Uh, so I think sometimes seeing the big idea can help you kind of weed through what you're dealing with. But it is interesting here the, the way it kind of builds to this climax and then descends from this climax. You know, everybody's invited to be a part of this new covenant that was made possible by this dying and coming to life servant. Everyone's invited. This is no longer about Israel. It's no longer about Jerusalem. It's no longer about a, a special people only for God uh, and the only people for God. It, it's no longer about association with the right group. It is about belonging to God, being in a covenant with God, being in that family. If you can be in that family, then you've got to realize the way to do that is you've got to decide whether you're going to be one of the wicked who reject this servant, or whether you're going to be one of the servants who follow the servant. Everybody with me? So you've got to make that choice. In making that choice, you've got to repent. Uh, there, there are sins that, that are a part of our lives, sins that are, in, in particular, talking about this people, but sins that they were involved with, that, that were kind of exposing who they were and what they were doing. Those sins have no place in God's kingdom. And so that's why this servant is there to announce God's kingdom. So if you want to be part of that kingdom, as grand and glorious and beautiful as it is, and honestly, a lot of the descriptions there, uh, we're going to talk about this in tonight's sermon as we talk about the afterlife. There's a lot of parallels there. We'll, we'll discuss that. If you want to be part of that kingdom you need to pray a prayer of repentance. And so there, in Isaiah, you actually have a prayer of repentance from the people. Then what you have is a contrast again of the wicked versus the servants, but now you've got more of a focus on the servants than you do the wicked. And you get to the very end, which is again... Uh, these servants are inviting, or, or along with the servants, are invited all nations to be a part of this new covenant. Uh, so you've got this great emphasis on the new covenant and the new kingdom. Now you take that and you put it back with the beginning of the book of Isaiah. The beginning of the book of Isaiah spends a lot of time in contrast. Judgment versus hope. Which side do you want to be on? Hope. Okay, you've got... Uh, the arrogant, lofty city versus New Jerusalem. Which part do you want to be with? New Jerusalem. You've got the wicked versus the righteous. Which part do you want to be with? The righteous. Uh, you've got the, the servant of God who's coming to redeem a lost people. Do you want to be with the servant or do you want to be with the lost people? Over and over and over again through the book of Isaiah, it essentially just lays out two options. 
You've got, you can either be on the right or you can be on the left. You can be with the, with the people of God or you can be with the wicked. You can be with the redeemed. You can be with the lost. You can, I mean, it, you've got this contrast laid out from beginning to end through history. This is how God has always worked. God has always made the choice clear, simple, something that all of us have to make. But if we'll make that choice, we will have hope. We will have a new city. We will have Jerusalem. We will have redemption. We will have remnant. We will be a part of the servant's kingdom. We will be part of God's family. We, you know, all of these things are laid out for us. And, and that middle section that we talked about, where there's that focus on who God is, that he is God, he is the only God, there is none like him, that is the answer for us. We're not sure who God is. Which way do we go? Get my point? We're not truly convinced that God is God, that God is in control, that God has the power to take care of us, to provide for us, to do the things that we need. Uh, if we don't have a God who truly can is greater than all these other gods, if we don't have a God who has the ability to know the future, if, you know, if our God isn't there, there's really no clear option here. All of the promises mean nothing. All of the hope really is deflated. There really isn't anything. The, the key to this whole thing, particularly for the book of Isaiah, is he is God, there is no other. That by itself, makes the choice clear. Any questions, thoughts, additions, comments, disagreements? Dan? Raised her hand on disagreement. I, no, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Just teasing. <laughs> Absolutely. And how many times is that re-emphasized for us in the New Testament? A lot. Because again, our only hope is not in some system of theology. It's not in some, really, even in some promise of a place that we don't really quite understand, like heaven or our fear of hell or, you know, our only hope is in the fact that he is God and there is no other. And he is near. And that he is in control. And that he is guiding things. And he is watching over us. I mean, everything comes back to God. And I think sometimes we can get lost in that. We can put our hope in the church. Depends on how you use that term, first of all. It depends on how well... You know, a lot can depend on the personalities and the, the people that sit in those pews when you place your hope in a church. Or we put our hope in an identity. You know, well, I'm a Church of Christ member or, you know, some sort of, of identity by which we have uh, defined who we are based on a name, based on, a, you know, th those types of things. All of those things can fail. There is only one answer if you're really looking for hope, and it's God. Now, God wants you to be a part of his church. God wants you to be associated with his people. I'm not discounting the importance of those other things, but those other things are not where our hope is placed. And I think I, I, you learn that lesson from Isaiah because here you got a people who have placed themselves in the hope of being an Israelite, of the right lineage, as Keith brought up earlier, of the right association. They have placed their hope in the, the temple uh, because you know, that was by God's design and that, that was built by God's blessing and God's presence dwelt there. Or they have placed their hope in 
false things. And Isaiah's point is, no, no. Realize, temples disappear. That temple will be burned to the ground as we're destroyed. Our nation disappears. Did the Israelites disappear, essentially? Absolutely, even though they placed their hope there. What was the one thing they, that, that they could count on to never fail? There is none like me. That's where the hope has to be placed. So, and that, that changes everything else. Anyway, I'm out of time. Thank you. Sorry, Chris, I didn't get to your comment. Yeah.